There were parts that were really funny. There were some great visuals. Every single man in the film was portrayed negatively. It's like, oh, when a man gets awakened and enlightened, he's suddenly a power hungry jerk. And that's not true. We are made to be interdependent. When it comes to men, we are not made to be their rivals, but their partners. And the reality is, no, no single person is enough for themselves. That is the hope though, that we are enough with God because God is with us. He is a father who loves us and he has eternal peace and joy waiting for us. So recently I went and I saw Barbie. I actually just saw it yesterday. And a few of my friends and I went together. They wanted to see it mostly to be able to comment on it in full disclosure. This was a bit of a girl's night, but it was after the kids went down, but it was also we all are involved in writing op-eds or doing podcasting or doing different things in the space of media. And so let's go check out this movie that has raked in over a billion dollars at the box office. A thank you to our sponsor, Every Life. Every Life is the pro-life diaper company. These diapers are as good as any other diaper you're going to find in the store, except the company loves babies and actually donates to the pro-life movement, including to organizations like Live Action. Check out Every Life diapers. Go to everylife.com. Use the code LILA10 for 10% off your first order. If you're a grandma or you're an aunt or you're just a friend and you know someone who's going to be having a baby or has a baby, order them some diapers. I can really be helpful and you can support the pro-life cause this way. Everylife.com. Sevenweekscoffee.com is a gourmet organic coffee company that is making delicious roasts that you're going to love. The best part about sevenweekscoffee.com is they donate 10% of all their proceeds, their revenue, not just their profits, to pro-life pregnancy resource centers. They've donated over $150,000 already. Join the 15,000 pro-life Americans already who are drinking Seven Weeks Coffee. Go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for 10% off your first order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. All right. So my immediate takeaways. Um, First of all, it was fun just going with friends. So that I think is one of the biggest reasons Barbie has been so successful is because it's drawing on what is a nostalgic experience for many, many people. And it's something you can do with your friends, with a group of people, no matter your age. I'm going to talk about that more later because I do think it's a major issue that's being marketed to kids. But the reality is groups of women and some men all over the country are flocking to go see this movie. And I understand the phenomenon because people love doing things together and having a reason to go do things together. It was hard to get through for me. There were parts that were really funny. There were some great visuals. The acting was really great. I mean, Margot Robbie is a fantastic actor. So there was definitely some really well done aspects of the film. But a lot of it was a lot of it was just hard to stomach because it was the through line. The one consistent thing in the movie was pretty blatant sexism misandry, sexism against men. So we're going to unpack that. I'm going to unpack what I thought about Barbie, what it means at this moment in culture, why it matters. First, we're going to start with the opening scene of the Barbie movie. You might have seen this. If you haven't already, here we go. Since the beginning of time, since the first little girl ever existed, there have been dolls. But the dolls were always and forever baby dolls. Until... So right now, they're throwing the baby dolls into the air and smashing their baby dolls. If you're listening to this on podcast, and then Margot Robbie shows up as the Barbie, and all the little girls are looking at this woman in a swimsuit who's very curvaceous, and then they're throwing their baby dolls. All right. So first of all, it's a clever opening scene because it's reminiscent of 2001 Space Odyssey. So it kind of, there's all these like little references throughout the film that are nostalgic for the film world, for the the, the doll Barbie, uh, for the you know 20th century. But the opening trailer immediately sets the tone, which was pretty consistent in the movie, which is that throw away your 
bar, throw away your doll, throw away your little baby doll and embrace your empowered, independent, autonomous, sexy Barbie. And I did not play with Barbies growing up. It's not that my parents were like, it's evil or anything. It just wasn't something that they chose to buy for me. I had some friends who played with Barbies. I never found them particularly attractive. I mean, I, I remember putting the shoes on and enjoying that and like putting the dresses on and enjoying that. But I always thought they were weird. They were weird looking dolls, very skinny, angular dolls that had these like large breasts that I didn't really connect with as a little girl. And I think the reason for that is because it is not natural. It is not natural to give a little girl a very tall, skinny woman figure with breasts on it and say that this is going to teach her about femininity. I don't think it does. I think it can be fun to dress up dolls and things like that. But the reason historically little girls have been given baby dolls is because little girls love babies. Children love children. Little kids love smaller kids than them and are fascinated by little babies. They're not fascinated by grown women adults and want to undress and dress them up again. They're fascinated by little dolls and little children that are newborns and a baby and a little toddler. I mean, my uh, almost four-year-old loves our almost two-year-old and is so excited that we're having another baby about what's this little baby going to look like. Every little kid I've ever encountered has an interest, at least, um, you know, is excited about other little kids. That's normal. So the fact that dolls from before all time were like little smaller children, basically, for the children to play with is normal. It's not the patriarchy. It's actually just human condition and and a beautiful part of humanity and human nature. All right. So throughout Barbie, first of all, there was a lack of just kids or children. Babies were only placed in Barbie in a negative light. When the babies were smashed at the beginning of the film, when pregnant Barbie was looked at with disgust or, you know, told, oh, she's been discontinued. And then the only other children that you see in the film really is this snapshot of this mother-daughter characters in the film and snapshots from that girl's childhood, which are really beautiful snapshots that show her growing up and getting disenchanted with her own family. So at the end of Barbie, there was a very redeeming scene, which was when, and I think this scene also meant a lot to a lot of people who saw it and made the film leave many people with a positive impression and make them feel very emotional, which is when Barbie is considering becoming a real person, you know, going to the real world, to leave, leaving Barbie land. This is after the Barbies take back Barbie land, and she's given this sort of vision of what it means to be in the real world, and that vision is really focused on mothers and their children, and there's all these mothers and their children that she sees, and then that's when she chooses to go back to the real world. And I do think that this had a lot of beauty to it because it was emphasizing the beauty, the value of mothers, intergenerational intergenerations, multiple generations, um, the value of children. I think when Barbie then chooses to enter the real world, there was kind of a contradiction in that when she's entering the real world, there was nothing left about her wanting to be a mother or have a family. It was more like, I'm going to go to the gynecologist's office. Again, not the OBGYN's office, the gynecologist's office. But I do think that was a beautiful moment in the film that gave a lot of people the impression that the film was celebrating that thing, which it was in that moment. So I wanted to call that out as a good thing. Another thing that I thought was good is at the end of the film as well, America Ferraro, or the sort of lead mother of the daughter who is helping take back Barbie land uh, and and is sort of like steering Barbie through the different um, transitions from real world to Barbie land, she makes this comment about how it is you don't have to be a career woman, basically, and maybe there can just be normal average Barbie that's a mom. And I think that was also really a beautiful moment that deserves praise because it was, I think, leveling a kind of aggressive careerism feminism, which has been a historical feminism, especially in the last century, that says that you, in order to be empowered as a woman, needs to go work like a man or just work in general. And that comment from Ferraro in the film was very much the opposite, that no, you don't have to be a career woman. In fact, you can be an everyday woman and be a mom, and that's totally fine too. Of course, the disadvantage there is it's sort of leveling like mom, career woman, whatever choice you make, it's fine. Yes, I think we have the power to choose, but I do think our society 
at large does denigrate motherhood or says that motherhood is just like any other career, when I think motherhood is in a class of its own. You know, raising the next generation, bringing children to the world is not like becoming a lawyer. There's something uniquely valuable about being a mother or being a father. And if you're not able to be a mother or father yourself, supporting mothers and supporting fathers more than just supporting a big corporation or a business or whatever else your career or calling, you know, your sense of calling might be. That being said, I thought it was beautiful, and I thought that that also left people towards the end of the film with a positive impression of motherhood. So kudos to Barbie for that. And to the many young women who ask the question, am I enough? Am I enough? Who always are trying to live up to some standard that they are maybe imposing on themselves or maybe someone's imposed, they feel is being imposed on them. I think the answer is, as God's daughter, you are enough by yourself on your own, no, none of us are enough. I mean, that is a fact. We are not enough. Uh, we will die. We will make mistakes. We will fail ourselves and other people. But we were created for love, to love and be loved. And we need to receive love first from our Creator, God our Father, in order to give love. Without knowing our identity as daughters of God, who God loves completely and unconditionally, and knowing that God has a plan of good for our lives to help us choose what is good and true and beautiful so that we can live what is good and true and beautiful. If we know that identity, we will find incredible freedom and I think peace. If we don't know that identity, we will always struggle like feeling we are not enough because we won't be enough. That is the hope though, that we are enough with God, in God who is perfect everything, we have everything and that the hardest struggles the biggest challenges we can overcome with peace, even when things are really, really hard, because God is with us. He is a Father who loves us, and He has eternal peace and joy waiting for us. So my encouragement to Barbie fans or anti-fans, wherever you fall, whichever camp you fall in, is the ultimate message of who are we, the ultimate message of am I enough? We are children of God. He is a Father who loves us, loves us so much, he sent His Son to die for us so that we could be reconciled with Him despite our mistakes and our sin and our suffering. And with Him, yes, you have more than enough. You have everything. Another theme at the end of Barbie was the question of who am I? So Ken is wondering, who am I apart from Barbie? Because Barbie's basically saying, you don't need me and like go off and find yourself, Ken. And that's that question is like, who am I apart from Barbie is sort of Ken's conundrum. I just don't know who I am without you. You're Ken. But it's Barbie and Ken. There is no just Ken. And there's sort of this idea in the film where Ken's off sort of like in this like mist figuring out who he is. And I do think that there's incredible value to asking the question, who am I? Like People should ask that question. And who you are isn't defined by your career or the clothes you wear. Those things can be aspects of how you live out who you are. But, you know, the film didn't answer the question in terms of who are you, your human be being made in the image of God, and you're created for love, to love and be loved. And, and often for many people that love is discovered, for all people it's discovered in community. Um, some people that's discovered in a vocation to marriage or the vocation to a religious life or a vocation to serve the community in a, in a unique single way. It didn't obviously answer that questions to that degree, but I do think there's value in encouraging people to ask the question at a very deep level, who am I? And to think past, you know, culture saying, well, you're, you're your job or you're your education or you're just the way that you look. So again, kudos to Barbie for unearthing that question. I do think it's a important question. Question wasn't answered. And I do think there's a danger in sort of endlessly going off into the mist and saying, who am I? And then you know, finding out, well, I am this feeling of wanting to be, you know, this famous artist, or I am this experience of wanting to, you know, make all of this success in this way, you know, that separated from, I believe, our fundamental identity as human beings created by God in His image will lead to bad paths if we don't see our identity as God's children created for love, to love and be loved. I do think the who am I question answered in another way will lead to dark paths. 
That's a topic maybe for another episode, though. And, you know, Barbie didn't full-on answer that question or try to. It didn't seem to anyways. Um, but I think it was positive that it even had the question in the film. So, apart from the blatant sexism and, you know, some of the, um, you know, very, I think, intense fe feminist ideology, those are some good themes. Now, back to the moment when America Ferrara is talking about, uh, you know, you can be a mom and, you know, what about average Barbie? And then Barbie has that vision of all of these women throughout history and that intergenerationalism. Again, a beautiful, what was missing though, right? Men, like men were not included in that vision. Um, Ken can go off and be himself and Barbie can kind of have children and exist with other Barbies without men. I mean, that was a part of the imagery there. And I think that that is not true, obviously. We, we need men, men need us, especially when it comes to future generations. There was a lot of animosity placed between Ryan Gosling, the Ken, and between Margot Robbie, the Barbie. And the whole film was about their dynamic and the animosity between them and about how Ken was basically useless to Barbie. And he had to understand ultimately that she didn't need him and that he needed to go find himself and that they weren't, they didn't really belong together. And I thought that was really sad, a really sad takeaway for the film, because it basically said that men and women don't need each other, that Barbie is better without Ken. And all the men in the film were shown to be these basically idiots who were either mean or power hungry or clueless, and they didn't really have much to offer the women in their lives. Barbie has a great day every day, but Ken only has a great day if Barbie looks at him. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. This wasn't just the dynamic between Barbie and Ken. This was the dynamic between the other character of the mother and her daughter. They talked about, do we need to tell dad that we're leaving town at one point? And they're like, no, he's fine. And they show him kind of babbling, almost like an idiot on a couch, trying to learn Spanish. And he doesn't even know how to do that. He was clueless. And they basically just didn't need dad. He didn't need to know where they do, what they were doing. They didn't need to tell him what he was doing. There was no need for there to be any communication between them. They could leave dad to basically rot in a sofa and it wouldn't matter. And they could go conquer the world together as women. That was the message, you know, that and then the only other men that you got to see were like bad characters in the patriarchy land. And then you got to see the bad board or the silly board of Mattel, which is the toy company that makes Barbie. So every single man in the film was portrayed negatively. Every single one. Even the non-Ken doll doll that was supposed to be a man that kind of ended up helping the Barbies take back Barbie land was shown to be kind of an idiot as well. There are no multiples of Alan. He's just Alan. Yeah, I, I'm confused about that. And I think that overall pervasive sexism in the film made it very hard to watch for me. There were some innuendos in the film that were pretty overt and pretty intense. And I thought that was also really sad because this is a film that's being marketed to children. I mean, Margot Robbie in part of the uh, PR for the film shared, no, it is for kids. It's for everyone. And we layered it to make it for some themes for adults and some themes for kids. Is this a kids movie or is it not a kids movie? It's, for, I, this is such like a thing people say when they do press for a movie. They're like, it's for everyone. But it was literally crafted to be for everyone. The comedy plays on so many different, the whole movie plays on so many different levels. And there's comedy in there that I think, you know, are going to go over the kids' heads and adults are going to, you know, laugh a lot and there's things that there really is something for everyone and so they put in raunchy themes and jokes like the joke about beach as an example which has these sexual connotations and they put that in there but they're like oh it's not a big deal because little kids won't understand what they're talking about i don't buy that i don't like this idea that you can layer in sex jokes into a film but make them ambiguous and so little kids can watch it it's not a big deal little kids are smarter than you think and they're growing up in this culture of whatever innuendos you're stuffing in your films so don't make a film that you want kids to see that have sexual innuendos in it. Just don't do it. I would be annoyed, and I should be, and any parent should be, if like some cartoon maker is making a cartoon that has sexual innuendos in it. You would say, this is disgusting, you're grooming kids. Why is it okay then to make a live action film that you're saying is for adults and kids that has sexual innuendos in it? It's not okay. So that I took serious issue with, and it, I think it's just because we don't take we don't take sexual innuendos, pornography, sexual objectification seriously enough as a culture. We just don't. We think it's a joke. We think it's okay. And it's not being approved to say, no, don't sexualize kids. Like, that's not prudishness. That's protectiveness. 
It's a protectiveness that kids deserve. So that is a big issue that I had with the film. All right, one last major takeaway to share. I want to mention the patriarchy. So there were a lot of themes about the patriarchy and how Barbie was going against the patriarchy, what it was implying, and it showed like past founding fathers who were all supposedly patriarchs and part of the patriarchy and how the world is a man's world. And Barbie was somehow trying to disrupt that. Listen, historically, when men have been rulers, especially in this country, when men have been rulers in government, et cetera, yes, there has been a very male-centric political system. That is a fact. It's a historical fact. But that's not because women were seen as less than. It's because property holders were primarily the ones that were given the vote. And it's that many women shared property in common with their husbands, and there was one vote for the household. In addition, the reason that men held office in many of these cases is they were seen as political leaders because they were often military or business leaders. So it wasn't that women are not good or valuable or women don't have a equal dignity to men. It was a more sense of we are family units and, you know, Abigail Adams is a unit with John Adams as opposed to Abigail Adams is a separate political and economic unit from John Adams. Now, I'm not saying that it's bad that people who are in the same economic unit, like a household, have two votes. I'm not saying that that's bad, but I'm saying that it's much more nuanced, the story of the patriarchy, as they call it in America, than this movie paints it to be. And that's no surprise because I think the popular trope of I'm a victim as a woman today needs to pretend that there is this this secret society that has existed before the dawn of time by men, not so secret even, but sometimes secret, in order to basically control and harm women. And that's just not the case. That's not to say that some men don't control and harm women. That is a fact. They do. Some women control and try to harm men. There will always be bad apples, but there's nothing in the male nature that wants to control and harm women. I think there's a brokenness that men can have that can lead them to controlling and harming women, but women have the same brokenness. The way the control and the harm looks different, I mean, that is true. Men are stronger than women, so they can be more physically harmful to women. Like, that is true. But I don't think women, by nature, are more innocent than men and don't do as many bad things as men by nature because we're just better people by nature. I think we're both human beings, men and women. We share human nature. We have unique differences as men and women, but one is not better than the other. And unfortunately, the message of Barbie, loud and clear, besides you need to go find yourself by being completely independent from everyone else, especially men, was that men are bad too. And I think that's just a really sad and untrue message. So you could say, well, come on, you're taking this too seriously. This is just a fun Barbie movie and they're so full of random stuff. And like, why are you reading into it so much? I don't think it's reading into it because in Hollywood and a lot of media today, there is a lot of messaging that says that as a woman, you don't need children or men. As human beings, we are made to be interdependent. When it comes to men, we are not made to be their rivals, but their partners. And men and women, I think together, from a spiritual perspective, make the image of God so beautifully. And that's why they can also bring life into the world. And they need each other for that. And that's a beautiful thing. So back to the competitiveness that we are in competition together and men bring us down. I think that has done so much damage to a generation of women. Can I blame feminism for that? Probably. I mean, a lot of feminist people who consider themselves feminists have this talking point, but ultimately it's one that is not going to bring joy to people because we are made for communion. We're made for relationship. We're made to be loved. We are not made to go it alone. And that's why the plan, I think God's designed for marriage, where a man and a woman marry each other, they share each other most intimately, they're committed to each other for life, they give each other their bodies, they can bring life into the world, and they have children. Now that child has an intact family with a mother and a father. That design is so beautiful. That's the design that we should be upholding and celebrating and exploring in media and art and movies, as opposed to glamorizing radical autonomy 
and the rejection, the rivalry with men. Another example with this in pop culture is the recent super hit song by Miley Cyrus called I Can Buy Myself Flowers. And a very clever account on YouTube did a mashup between Miley singing I Can Buy Myself Flowers with Bruno Mars singing the popular pop star singing I Wish I Had Bought You Flowers, I think is the line. Um, Let's take a listen. All right, so on the one hand, Bruno Mars is saying, I wish I bought you, I should have bought you flowers. And she is, Miley is singing, I, I can buy myself flowers. I should have held your hand. And she's saying, basically, I don't need a man. And it's just back and forth between them. This is a mashup, obviously. But the point is, okay, he failed me. And Bruno is sort of admitting in the song, oh, I should have done all these things. I should have valued you more. He's taking responsibility for that. And Miley's sort of, you know, response song in the mashup is, I don't need you anymore, right? And I think this is another aspect of the rivalry is that we do fail each other. Men fail women and women fail men. That is a fact. I guarantee you I'm married. I make mistakes in my marriage. That is a fact. I am not perfect. No human being is perfect. Okay, what do we do with the inevitable failures? What do we do with the inevitable failures between men and women? Do we seek to heal the rift? Or do we double down on the failure and say, we don't belong together anymore? And again, people will say, well, you know, some marriages need to be separated because of abuse. I mean, like, (laughs) I already can, like, hear the comments coming. And this is not about that. Like, that's not what I'm even talking about here. Obviously, if there's some severe abuse in a marriage, uh, then their separation can be the most loving thing for both parties, especially the people being abused. But the point here is, There is no perfect man. There is no perfect woman. We're going to fail each other. We're going to misunderstand each other. The only way forward is for us to try to understand and love one another. It's not the message of Miley Cyrus. She's celebrating her hurt and her radical autonomy. They say that the song was written actually to her ex-husband, which is really sad. They apparently had an on and off relationship for years and sincerely loved each other, but you know, Miley's complicated and they separated and, you know, it's about basically, I don't need you anymore. And, and, and it's not just, I don't need you. It's, I don't need you and I'm enough for me. And the reality is no, no single person is enough for themselves. We are made to be interdependent. We are made to be in community. Some of us might not marry, but we're made to have deep and, and, and responsible relationships, meaning we actually have a responsibility to a community that we're helping to care for and love. They help and care for us. That might be our immediate family. It might be adopted family, but we are made for community with each other. We're not made to go it alone, but that's not the message of most pop culture today. One more note on the rivalry thing. In Barbie, Ken was depicted as going to the real world, meaning basically America today, and being so excited by how men were in charge and everything was about men. First of all, that's not the way the world is today. By a lot of standards, women are faring better with mental health, economically, uh, in their longevity, how long they live, women fare better. They More women graduate college today. So that's just not a, that's not a fact. But in addition, it had this scene where Ken goes to the real world and he wants to all of a sudden be in power. Like he wants to be more important and more powerful than anybody, especially Barbie. And I think that's really sad because it's like, oh, when a man gets awakened and enlightened, he's suddenly a power-hungry jerk. And that's not true. I think when a man gets enlightened and awakened and really understands who he is in in his masculinity, he realizes the power he has to do good and to love and to serve other people. And that brings out his manhood, his power to provide, his power to protect. These are things that can be uniquely masculine, especially in a marriage, in a, in a, in a family, to bring good. So what's the lasting impact of Barbie? Is there a lasting impact? What does this mean for the future? Any final thoughts here? I think Barbie as a doll and what it did for a generation of girls and as a movie will have impact. Of course it does. It's made over a billion dollars. 
And while it can be fun to watch and nostalgic, and I totally get that, and I'm not saying it wasn't fun and taking that fun away from people, because it was, there is fun to that. Going to the movies is fun with your friends, period. And watching something that looks really, you know, pretty and glitzy and it brings nostalgia back to you and uh, has all of these like fun references and a lot of good jokes. There were some good jokes in there. I totally understand why people loved it. I totally do. But when the takeaway message is, I don't need you, I can do it on my own. And the takeaway message is men are basically useless. It's a very sad takeaway message. Okay. What do we do? I know there's some people like, oh, you know, there's all these crazy movies out there and all of this woke content and, you know, this proportion stuff, the culture's so rough. Listen, we just have to invest in the things we care about. If you want to see good media out there, help invest in it. You don't have to be the creator yourself. You can invest in a creator. My company, GTB, is producing this podcast. We're a low-budget operation right now, but we're starting to we're starting up. I would love your investment. I would love you to become a patron. We have feature-length films we want to produce in the future. We have other podcasts. We have a dating podcast we want to produce. We have a lot of cool stuff that we're planning on in the future. We need partners. Put your resources behind the things that you might believe in or you want to see out there in the world. That's how we change culture, okay? It's not like, oh, we need to go and just sit and suffer. Oh, poor us. Look at Barbie. <laughs> like, um, no, choose to create the things you want to see in the world or help other people create them. I'm really hopeful. There's been a lot of amazing stuff. Sound of Freedom did so well in theaters. We interviewed Eduardo Verastegui, the lead producer on the podcast last month, and he was fantastic. And I know those guys and they're making more stuff. And I see, you know, people out there doing great content online, making a difference. You know, there are good kids shows. Bluey, as an example, like has a lot of good values. There's nothing bad in there that I've seen so far. There's good stuff that is happening. Go out and help be a part of it because that's how we're going to change culture. That is the only way forward is for us, just like the message that I had earlier, the message for Barbie, you're not a victim. Take responsibility for your life. Your life is about service of others. <laughs> that is the message for us too when it comes to the complaints about culture. We are not victims. We got this. Do our parts. We can make a difference.